Well, good morning, Hillcrest. Man, we are so glad you are here to worship with us this morning. Um, if we've not had an opportunity to, to meet, my name is Jack. I'm the worship pastor on staff here, and I'm so glad that you joined us every week uh, to worship. If you're new around here and you want to figure out how to get plugged into Hillcrest, what we're doing, and um, Oregon, the community that we're impacting, uh, we have a first, uh, a next steps class over here, first step. Um, and so we just encourage you to stop by, meet and greet some of the people that are um, uh, volunteers and staff around here, um, get a little snack. Um, and then also, our women's retreat is this weekend. And so, man, it's been so great. They wanted to say, send a little video just saying hi. Uh, and so actually, Tyler, can you cue that again? That was awesome. That was awesome. All of our ladies of Hillcrest just saying hi. And so we just wanted to show that to you guys. It's been a pl uh, privilege for them to kind of go and be away. And so for you men who've been at home taking care of the kids and the house and the dishes and the laundry and all that, man, we are so thankful for you and your time and energy put into that. Would you please stand as we begin our time worshiping? This is the first week of Easter Epiphany. The Lord begins his ministry. He begins um, the, these, by these words, right? The Lord uh, has anointed me, and the prophecy has been fulfilled this day. And it's the beginning of our testimony, our story uh, coming to fruition, right? The Lord has paid for our sin and debt, and we get to rejoice in that. Like lightning, I saw darkness run for color. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. The miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Yeah, my praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life This great street of my story I'll testify But Jesus Christ the righteous This is my testimony, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, come together, sons and daughters. Bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from there to life. This great sin of my story, I'll testify. Jesus Christ, the righteous, I'll testify. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Testimony from death to life, cause great 
history of my story, I'll testify that Jesus Christ the righteous, I'll testify this is my testimony. From there to life, the history of my story. I'll testify that Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm testifying. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. I'm just going to read these words over us real quick. Luke 4. And when he had come to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as usual he entered the synagogues, and on the Sabbath day he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he rolled, he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim uh, the year of the Lord's favor. And then just a few verses later, he says, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. As I said, this is the first week of Easter where we celebrate the epiphany, the Lord's coming, and this is his words. As he began his ministry, this has been fulfilled. Christ's coming and his death and resurrection, and so, man, we are so excited to worship that. Um, We're going to sing this song, How Deep, because this is him, his story, coming down uh, from the Father's love. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice. 
eternally right relationship with you so father we thank you we praise you amen church you may have a seat Hillcrest family. Hey, it is good to be with you. Uh, I, just, uh, I just dropped my in-laws off at the Madison uh, airport this morning. We were there, uh, left at 4.30-ish, so, uh, so we'll see how the morning goes, but we're here, and uh, I got to brag uh, on, on, uh, on us, on, on you guys this week with my in-laws, and just tell them how thankful I am. Hard to believe, two and a half years, but just got to celebrate God's faithfulness through relationship and just how meaningful this church family is and the way you guys have come around my family. And, uh, and so got to brag on you guys a little bit this week. Um, but when I mentioned that I took my in-laws to the airport to someone this morning, they said, David, you sounded a little bit too excited when you shared that with us. So we had a great week. It was a good time. Uh, and and a lot of good stuff coming up. We're going to spend the next four weeks uh, just, just looking at the Easter story. And, and we're going to start today with Jesus teaches. And we're going to look at the Beatitudes. Next week, look at the triumphal entry and, and just the power of what it means as Jesus rides in and fulfills some prophecies attached to that. And then the following, Easter, Sunday, and Good Friday. It, it's going to be a great weekend, Jack designs a great Good Friday service, a, a very meaningful uh, celebration for me. You get so familiar with this story that sometimes it doesn't touch your heart, but, but the way Jack designed our service, Good Friday service, was incredibly meaningful. And then on April 24th, I, I hope you get to text in or email some questions, because on April 24th, we're talking about Jesus reigns and how, what does it look like as we await his return, that there are challenges that we face on our Monday to Saturday. We want to celebrate questions and try to continue the conversation. So on April 24th, it'll be a, a, a format of more of a discussion and panel style. And so questions that might be elicited from what's going on in your guys' worlds. And immediately following, hey, if you're new around here, in the seat back in front of you, there's a Connect card. If you're new, we'd love to get to know you. Anonymity is not a value around here. And so uh, the first Sunday of every month, we do a step one, just a meet and greet with uh, me and a few other leaders. We want to get to know you. We are a family church, and I love that about who we are. And then coming up on April 8th, 
This coming Saturday, uh, Aaron does a great quarterly opportunity. Uh, if, if you'd love to serve, I know Aaron is always looking for people to, to partner with and then put on a, a more outward-facing opportunity to connect those that have yet to treasure Jesus, uh, just to have a party in Jesus' name and, and have a fun night of a very low-key, um, I couldn't tell you all the details of, of what might be coming, but Aaron's got some great stuff planned. So tell me, tell me if this sound sounds familiar. You guys heard this before? Does this mean anything to you? It, it, feels, <laughs> it, it feels like in our world, phone calls are a lost art unless you're getting spam called from somebody. It's just a lost art. We just text, right? We could probably learn to call more. And, and so when I, was in, when I was in elementary age, they would publish like a, a phone book. You guys, you guys know what these things are? So they'd publish a phone book of other peers in your class. And, and so I remember, this gives you a small window, this relational passion predates you guys, right? There's been some other layers. So I was in middle school, elementary school, and I remember opening up that, that packet and going name by name, number by number through all the peers in my class. And I just pick up the phone. It was, it was like an old like plug-in phone, not a cell phone, right? You'd actually go to the wall. It was attached. It had a cord on it. For you guys under the age of like 20, yes, there was something that predated this thing. And so I would go there, and I punched in the numbers, and I'd call people one by one by one. Because there's this sense of when you call someone, it's a call towards what? Connection, relationship. There's this invitation towards relationship. And what Jesus is going to do today through the Beatitudes could be different than the way you've heard the Beatitudes preached. So I want to give you a little preview. We're going to, we're going to walk through the Beatitudes, but we're going to take, it's going to be a minority position. You've probably heard the Beatitudes preached as the B attitudes of things to attain. But I think as we look through the text, we're going to see a call to relationship. We're going to see Jesus giving the accessibility of the kingdom to everyone through him. That this thing called the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount is this iconic, mysterious sermon because Jesus is inviting, he's beginning this process of inviting us into the upside down kingdom and he's wrapping us up into something so much bigger than us. So I want to read the Beatitudes and we're going to walk through it, but I want you to have the lens, the frame of Jesus' call to relationship. That the Beatitudes aren't something to attain, the Beatitudes, but actually an invitation. It's about accessibility in Jesus. So here we go. Matthew 5, 1 to 12, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs, present tense, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This morning, Jesus now is stepping on the scene, moving from unknown to known, and he's going to teach us, and he's going to unveil his upside down kingdom. So pray with me as we dig into this Easter season and the words of our Savior. God, 
We just want to hear from you always. We just want to passionately pursue you through your word, not, not, not flippantly, not casually, but we want to hear from you, God, through these words that we believe you inspired uh, through this gospel writer, Matthew. And so help us hear from you and, and what you have for us. Always for your glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. So from unknown to known, Jesus teaches and unveils his upside down kingdom. He tells us the good life is found in him. The, the good life is found in Jesus. So, so who is and who is not allowed access to this thing? Here's where we're headed. That the kingdom of God is at hand and the invitation to enjoy God's kingdom is for everyone. And accepting God's invitation has incredible implications. So we'll start here. The kingdom of God is at hand. So open, open to Matthew, because I think this is fascinating, just to see it. Matthew chapter 4. And here's what he says in Matthew 4. So Matthew, quoting Jesus, he's given us, he's given us a genealogy, He's given us a little bit about a birth. He's told us about John the Baptist. And now, here's what he says in Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and I love this word. I, you guys know I, I never do this, right? Because I, I, I don't want to make the Bible so inaccessible. I love that English translators, these guys are brilliant, right? Right? They, they translate Greek words into English for us. I'm thankful. So I never do this, but I love this word repent because contained in the idea of repent is a change, but more than that, a change in thinking. What you believe to be true, now you're changing your mind. You're changing your thinking. Metanoia, change in thinking. It's a fascinating Greek word, repent. Change in thinking. Why? What do I need to change my thinking about? Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, so what does it mean? What's Jesus calling his, his listeners to when he says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand? What does it mean that something's at hand? And I think this is fascinating. The call to relationship, Right? Continue to see this through that lens. The kingdom is present. It's at hand. Why? Because Jesus is now here. The God man, God becomes man. He's now here present. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, not exclusively seen always for this later time at a place far away. Jesus says the kingdom is near. It's present. Why? Because the king has arrived. The kingdom is about three ideas. This King Jesus is now starting to form a people out of the culture, out of the world we're in. He's now forming a people that will live together under this reign. King Jesus and his reign is now starting to form a people. And he says, repent. Why? Because Jesus doesn't just want to be a thing. <laughs> And just want to be one of the many things in our lives. He wants to be the thing. That King Jesus is now on the scene. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This call towards relationship. Now, I find this fascinating. Because growing up at the church, it's not always all that fascinating to think of King Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's kind of become this familiar character we know him, we heard the stories, died on the cross, got it, David. We just bought a fish tank. And you guys probably already assumed this to be true. I bought six fish, all of them died. <laughs> I, called the I called the place, I'm like, hey, all the fish died. They said, what water did you put in there? And they said, well, maybe you might have had hand sanitizer on your hands. I thought I was like cleaning up to get the fish. Actually, turned out I killed them, so... I still owe my kids some fish, but we have this stinking, and the stinking fish tank caused them, so, they, they just, 
they just get you, right? They have this beautiful picture of what it all looks like. And then you open the box and all it is is the tank. Then you got to go buy the rocks and you got to go buy the plants. So it doesn't quite look like that, right? And ours might be a little bit smaller. But there's this fascinating thing about a fish tank. You can stare at these little things. Before they died, my kids were just glued to this thing. <laughs> and they wanted to have a burial. We decided, we'll just circle a trust. We'll just flush them down the toilet. <laughs> so, so, so they're just staring at these things, right? They're just staring at these fish. But here's the thing, the fascinating thing about our God. We get so mesmerized by a fish tank. He's got an ocean full of these things that he just enjoys to watch, right? Just to continue to broaden our horizon of who this King Jesus is that we follow. I don't know if you watched the game last night. I love this stuff. We stayed up till, I don't know, I think it finished around like 1030, something like that. It was a fascinating game. And one of you guys, if one of you guys are in the IT world, please come and help me with my internet. There's a minute and a half left in the game and my internet just dings out. Oh, it's that little spinny circle of death started going on. My in-laws were looking at me. I'm like, what am I supposed to do about the internet? That's not, that's not on me. So minute and a half left in this game. Fascinating game, right? I mean, just to watch these guys. My, there was a time, a long time ago, that I could barely dunk a basketball. Just to watch these guys, fascinating. Just their, their athletic ability, what they can do with the ball, it's unreal. I just think God has a glimpse, not just of one game in one moment, but you see on either end, Christian Leitner, Michael Jordan, looking at it all in a timeless sense. How do you wrap your head around this stuff? And here's a quote that I love that captures this from a guy named Dallas Willard in a book called The Divine Conspiracy. Human beings can lose themselves in a card game or electric trains and think they are fortunate, but to God, there is available in the language of one reporter, towering clouds of gases, trillions of miles high, backlit by nuclear fire and newly forming stars, galaxies cartwheeling into collusion and sending explosive shockwaves boiling through millions of light years of time and space. These things are all before him, along with numberless unfolding rosebuds, souls, and songs, and immeasurably more of which we know nothing. When we hear about King Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, what comes to mind? Do, do, we, do we get fascinated of, oh, that's just familiar? Or when Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's actually offering an invitation that is unlike any other. The kingdom of God is present through relationship with Jesus. And the invitation to enjoy God's kingdom is for everyone. Here's how Matthew records it. So go back to chapter 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Matthew begins to record what's taking place. And here's what he says. And he, Jesus, went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And seeing the crowds. So who's in that crowd, according to Matthew? Because here's the cool part for me. These biblical writers are trying to include details because they got a point to tell us. Right? Whenever you tell a story, you include certain deals, details because you got a point you want to share. What does Matthew say about this crowd? Who are they filled with? Could be filled with a lot of people. Matthew just doesn't include them. Here's the people Matthew chooses to include. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, the epileptics, the paralytics, and he healed them. So who's in this crowd? Some broken, 
disenfranchised, not your spiritual elite, but rather the people that are often ostracized or found on the fringe of society, those that were left on the side of the road because they contained some disease and now they're left outside of the city and proclaimed unclean. And Jesus is healing these guys. And in that moment, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and he sat down and his disciples came to him. So how do we know this isn't just some little off group that he's talking to? Matthew ends the Sermon on the Mount this way. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teachings, for he was not teaching them as one who had authority and not, it was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So Jesus is saying something about the kingdom in this beginning of the Beatitudes and then throughout the Sermon on the Mount that is revolutionary. We want to ask, what's he saying? Here's what he says. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, now is he teaching some esoteric, lofty, here's the new B attitudes you need to attain to in order to be a part of my kingdom? Or is he actually giving a call to relationship? Here's what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, present tense. He's looking out on this crowd of misfits and nobodies. And he turns to them in the midst of their pain and says, you know, you're probably not the one that gets asked to pray at dinner. You're not the one that people are going to for some spiritual counseling or advice. You're poor in spirit. How's that often seen? You read in humility. But Jesus is looking at a bunch of broken people and saying, I understand the scribes don't think very much of you. But yours is the kingdom of heaven. The spiritual zeros of our world? The kingdom is actually for them. Those without a biblical degree, those without some kind of lofty spiritual background or character, theirs is the kingdom. This upside down invitation that the kingdom is accessible for all. We'll just keep walking through it. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. We usually read in some spiritual wisdom into that and blessed are those who mourn their sin. Or, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom is at hand. And who is this kingdom for? Blessed are those who are mourning and grief stricken in their brokenness because they've been deserted and left. These people that are crowding around him, Jesus says the kingdom is available for you. He keeps going, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. We often read that word and go, well, that means power under control. Or the word is literally gentle and mild in spirit. People that are just getting run over because their disposition isn't as compelling or power hungry. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be satisfied. Those that are longing for justice in this world and it just never seems to come. The kingdom is available. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. People just get walked on and trampled. The kingdom is available. And here's a tough one. Blessed are the pure in heart. Pure being those that are trying to keep all the rituals to the best of their ability, the pure in heart, pure from the being, the perfectionist, those that are just trying to figure out all the ways to attain a certain status instead, Jesus says, "May <laughs> stop striving and find rest and reconciliation in me. Repent for the kingdom is at hand. Why? Because King Jesus has arrived and the accessibility of the kingdom, the call for relationship is through me. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those that get caught in the middle, you're trying to navigate between two competing people and you just get stuck in the middle. For they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are you 
who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for present tense, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on whose account? My account. Blessed are those who have gone off their rocker and taken up with King Jesus. If that's who you're identifying with, is he telling us that we should strive to be poor? Is he telling us strive to to be sad? Is he instructing us to be sad? It feels like it gets a lot clearer when we see the sermon recorded in Luke. Here's how Luke records it. Because we love to spiritualize it. Jesus is talking to a group of spiritual zeros and saying, I know everyone else in this culture has overlooked you, but you can find rest in me. You wonder why Jesus was ridiculed constantly for eating and drinking with sinners and tax collectors. Luke says this, and he came down with them and stood in a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Who's in the crowd? Luke gives the same context. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured and all the crowd sought to touch him for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted his eyes on his disciples and he said, blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of heaven. If he's saying this is a B attitude that we should strive for, the evangelical church broadly is in a lot of trouble. Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because your happiness, your joy isn't tied to your circumstances. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets, but woe to you, O rich." for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. If you're finding security and fulfillment in anything a part of, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. The kingdom is available. Now, now we could apply this in a silly way. The silly way would be, You know those Vikings fans? They're included too. I know you sometimes doubt that, but yes, those Vikings fans, they're included too. The bald, the ugly, the old, the misshapen, the socially awkward. The kingdom is available. The kingdom is available. But now take it one more step to the serious. If Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and it's found in a call to relationship through him, Through him, who's it open to? The broke and the broken, the drug addicts, the divorced, the barren, the pregnant too many times at the wrong time, the brain damaged, the the older ill that have no value to society and people want to euthanize them. Man, the brain damaged, anyone's invited. The underemployed, the unemployed, the lonely, the emotionally starved or the emotionally dead, the Republicans, the Democrats, everyone in a serious way is invited to the kingdom through Jesus. And go one more step. Man, it's somewhere you might find yourself saying, them too? (laughs) They're included? The sinners and tax collectors, Jesus, they're included? Jesus, you're a drunkard. You're always hanging with these people. The immoral, the murderers, the child molesters, the bigoted, the filthy perverted, and the filthy rich, the vengeful, the war criminals, they're invited. Jesus teaches, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Paul picks up on this theme. He says this in his letter to the Corinthian church. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Those that continue to find life apart from Jesus, here's the list he gives us. 
Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. If you continue to live in your sin and practice your sin, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But then Paul says this about his readers, of us, and such were some of you. You were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit our God. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the kingdom is available for all. But accepting God's invitation has stinking significant implications. From that time, Jesus began to say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And sometimes this call to follow, to repent and turn in our thinking, gets confusing. What is that? Matt, could you come up here for one second? And I gave you at least a little warning. You want to come over here? Stand on this side? Get my better side on this side? <laughs> that was a small joke. Thank you for those that appreciated it. Thank you. Because sometimes this call can be confusing. What, what is this call to follow Jesus? Because you look at our lives, and we got jobs, right? We got jobs. So I'm just going to picture that through these commentaries that you guys actually pay me to study these things still baffles me. But hold that. Because we got jobs. And, and you guys know I just had a baby, right? A year and a half ago. I think of diapers are expensive. And, and the time you got to commit, I mean, it's just overwhelming at times, right? And, and, and you know, every once in a while, Casey calls me and says, hey, David, can you pick up some groceries? And I, I got to go ding around and do that again. And all right, you want this? Where do you want to hold that? You want to hold it there? But the joy is also being able to pick out the coffee that I want. But we got stuff going on in our life, right? We got stuff to do. And then, man, you start trying new things, you know, and I start coaching. I mean, it's a ton of fun, right? I'm coaching the girls in basketball. You want to put your chin on that, maybe? And then, you know, we've been building a deck. I mean, it takes time. It takes time to do this. Hey, you got that, Matthew? Yeah. And then, I mean, you got to take care of some personal stuff, right? I mean, so, so I mean, I gotta, I gotta go play basketball every once in a while. I mean, I mean it might not look like I play that often, but I try to play occasionally. So, and I might need to get some new shoelaces. I was playing and one of my shoelaces ripped and I was looking around, so I just snagged them from another shoe and Jimmy rigged that. And, and then, you know, spring is coming. I don't know if you know this, but spring is coming. And so it's time, I mean, it's time to get, I mean, Eden, we got her, you know, we're going to try and get her going sometime, maybe tag her on the back of the bike. I mean, spring is coming, That's so, <laughs> yeah, so spring is coming here soon, and, and so we got to get new bikes. Where do we have time, this call to follow, David? What, what am I supposed to do? How do I add one more thing to my already busy life? Jesus seems to have a different view of what this thing's supposed to look like. That instead of adding one more thing to our plate, it's actually in the midst of all this activity, along the way, that we're inviting people all around us into the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of us at hand. Rather than seeing basketball and sharing our hope in Jesus as two separate things, those that love under, underwater basket weaving are going to have to hear about Jesus from someone other than me. <laughs> Those in different demographics or spheres of life, you've actually been planted in this call to follow in all these spheres of life. Thank you, Matthew. You're so good. You could drop that sort of gently. There's some good granola in there. You don't want to... <laughs> some Dodd's pretzels. 
Thank you, Matthew. Hey, and Fred's got a Firefly gift card for you, potentially. <laughs> That's, yeah, there you go. That's for Britt. <laughs> there you go. Here's the journey. It's actually in all these things where the call to follow happens. And it's a process. It's no longer, I have to have arrived yesterday in order to be invited. That Jesus doesn't accept me where I am. Instead, he just keeps calling us to one step further in. What is evangelism then? It's simply inviting those that have yet to treasure Jesus in the context of any of these activities in our life to find their joy, to repent, believe in the kingdom is at hand. And then what then is discipleship? It's just the ongoing process of growing more into that. In all of these things, seeing our time, our treasure, our talent spent in a way that reflects the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it comes with a cost. Repent. <laughs> there is a cost. But we pay it gladly. Why? Because we are fascinated with the, the call to relationship of who this Jesus guy is that, that calls us to find life in his name. And here's the challenge. This call for all is missed when we fail to recognize I was dead on the bottom of the ocean floor, but for God's grace, ransomed my soul. <laughs> it's missed when we fail to recognize that reality and don't remember as often what took place in our own lives and are content with some of the things that still cling to our souls. And so here's, here's the call. The call to relationship and the invitation for others. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so here's the implications for us. What does this look like in our Oregon, southern Wisconsin, 22nd, 21st century, April, snow on the ground? Where are the areas that we still need to see more of Jesus in these areas? And so we're just going to reflect collectively as we walk through these. As the worship team comes up, we're just going to spend some extended time reflecting the areas where we too can continue to see more of Jesus. So I think of this area. What might we need to repent of? There's these things called the sins of commission. Th things that we are actively engaging in. And, and, and they war against our lives. And, and so we, we come to the cross this Easter season, repenting of whatever might be going in our lives. Sexual sins that still just seem to cling way too closely to us. Uh, a level of control or an expression of anxiety when things don't go our way? Is there anger and wrath that we pour out on others when they don't do exactly what we want them to do? Is food or work just becoming so overwhelming that we think another bit of food or another hour at work is going to fulfill our deepest longing. That gluttony or this workaholic culture that we live in. Things that we need to repent of. Is there something that we've elevated above King Jesus? Or sins of omission. Things that we're not doing that would reflect a life of someone who is living life in the kingdom. Not worshiping, 
Not seeing that primarily done on Sundays, but rather a lifestyle in our Monday to Saturday where, where we just get caught up in our day to day and we forget the sense of God's presence. We're just not worshiping. We're not praying or being still. We often feel that stillness is, is laziness or slothful. Instead, this beautiful reflection of resting in Him. We're not generous with our time, our treasure, our talent. We instead keep things for ourselves. When we see opportunities, we don't step into them. These sins of omission where someone wrongs me and I am unwilling to forgive. And I'm not living my life on mission as an everyday missionary, as a Christian in all aspects of life. God, we want to bring these before you and lay them at your feet. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Sins of commission, sins of omission, and sins may be done towards others. Uh, of hypocrisy, where we feel like we're in the right. The religiosity or the judgment that we might spew on someone else with our tongue, the power of the tongue to gossip, to slander to tell inconsistencies or just an indifference towards those around us. And the thing that wrecks my heart all the time, not making this a list of now ought to's and be attitudes, but rather continuing to see the sins of ourselves where we heap guilt or self-condemnation for not fulfilling some law. This Easter season, God, we want to cling more fully to you. We believe the kingdom is at hand in your presence. There is fullness of joy. And it is available to all. Help us live more fully in our day-to-day -day with the radical implications. And as we anticipate your work on the cross, may we bring these sins to you that we desperately want to repent of and trust that even in our brokenness, you meet us there. The kingdom is available for all. Thank you, Jesus, always for your glory, we pray. Amen. you please stand with us as we respond?
Because of him, this is our victory. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle. You 
Every single week, we love singing songs of God's faithfulness, telling stories of life in the body, hearing a sermon from the text. And every week, part of our practice is we want to send you back out to life Monday to Saturday as followers of Jesus. And so whatever might be challenging you this week, I hope there is confidence to find increasing life in his name. May I pray that over us this Easter season. God, you are so good. Whatever may be facing us this week, we want to cling more fully to you that there is a call to relationship. Your kingdom is at hand through life in your name. And so we we repent from whatever might be clinging to our souls as we continue this journey of following after you in our Monday to Saturday. Thank you, Jesus, always for your glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. Go with God.